the Sustainable Media Management Master's program, you are answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. But at the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. This seminar is sponsored by BEM Systems, Brown and Codwell, and brought to you by the Stevens Institute Center for Environmental Systems. Thank you, uh, Professor Sarkar. Thank you, Samir, and everyone for inviting me to be with you today. Uh, and thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, many at Stevens Tech, uh, and I mentioned earlier that uh, one of my earliest mentors uh, is a graduate of Stevens Tech, so I, I feel indebted to the academic institution here that uh, I, I owe a lot to. And, and I'm happy to be with you here today to, to talk about a, uh, a topic that uh, I feel is a worthy cause, and, and that is the subject of energy storage. Uh, you are uh, in the different aspects of sustainability, uh, from different angles, and we today will talk more about the electricity market in, in particular. And within the electricity market, we call energy storage today the holy grail of the power or the energy sector, because without energy storage, we can't get solar energy at night, or we can't get wind power when the wind is not blowing. So energy storage remains one of the last hurdles in the electricity sector that once solved and addressed, we can um, frankly have a real shot at attending to climate change and tackling a global problem. What is um, interesting about the electricity market, it's, it's a, an under and severely underutilized system. Uh, anyone knows what the largest and most expensive machine built in the United States is? Any guesses? The biggest machine in the country and the most expensive. That's part of it. Well, it, it happens to be the grid. The grid in its entirety has power plants, has transmission lines, has hydro dams, has uh, transformers, uh, you name it, solar systems, wind systems, they're all interconnected and they come all the way to here. This wire coming through the wall is part of that machine. It's a multi-trillion dollar machine in terms of the total cost over the years. And that machine delivers electricity. That is the commodity that comes through the system. And that machine, it's expensive and it delivers a commodity. The reason we say commodity is when we look up and we see the light on, it's on because electrons came through the wires and the light is on. But we're really, you know, that electron, whether it came from a coal plant, a gas plant, a solar system, we cannot tell the difference. That's kind of why we call it a commodity. It is not differentiated. And as a commodity supply system, the grid is unique. The electric grid has unique attributes. So if we look at the supply-demand dynamics in many of the commodity supply systems around the world, we'll find that storage plays an important role. Whether you're looking at food supply, looking at uh, oil, 
which is part of the energy supply, for example, in the oil sector, uh, you can see that we have about 12% of the annual consumption uh, that is stored in the system. And that allows the system to be further optimized. And it's important that that acts as a buffer. But if you look at the electricity sector, we don't really <clears throat> store electricity today. I'm not talking about energy. I'm not talking about storing liquid fuels or storing coal. I'm talking about electricity. Once it's in the wires, what's in the grid, there is very small percentage of that that is stored in electrical storage systems like batteries. And so <clears throat> when, we look, when we look at the grid, and the grid you know, on this slide uh, has some figures that represent the scale in terms of the number of power plants, over 17,000 power plants, be it gas, coal, wind, solar, or over 164,000 miles of transmission, or over 3 million miles of distribution. Look at the utilization factor. You have the most expensive machine in the country, yet on the average, it, its utilization is about 41%. And the reason is the grid is built and designed and optimized to meet the peak hours in the year. And, you know, generally that's in the summer when we have air conditioning load that represents a large percentage. And when you look at a, a curve that represents the hours, kind of the peak hours in, in the year, you'll find that the, that very few hours in the peak actually are very expensive to the system, extremely expensive. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a study done uh, in Massachusetts and uh, in the study on the energy supply side of the grid, the top 1% of the peak hours are responsible for 10% of the total cost. That's a 10x multiplier on the top 1% and the top 10% of the peak hours are responsible for 40% of the total system cost on, on the energy supply side. That gives you an indication of how this system is not optimal. And um, it is a challenge. It is what stands in the way today of seeing more renewables uh, become uh, a larger contributors on the grid in terms of solar and wind. Typically, people stop at a percentage, not because of the cost is not there. Solar is very inexpensive. Wind is very inexpensive. But because, frankly, the system can take more than a few percentage points in. And some countries have reached a much higher level of penetration. But you have to counter that with some form of storage in the form of other supply to firm up renewables. So that's just on the renewable side. So, so what you see from here is that as a commodity supply system, the grid is expensive, but it's underutilized. And um, if we look at why energy storage, there are frankly many reasons why we need energy storage. And when I talk about energy storage, um, energy storage can come in the form of hydro storage, thermal storage, many forms. But um, probably the most relevant uh, of examples nowadays, kind of battery storage, because we see most of grid storage nowadays. The new addition on the grid is represented by chemical storage in the form of batteries. So, so when we think about energy storage, uh, we notice that there are mega trends in play today that are helping energy storage. And one of them we just touched upon is renewable energy. Renewable energy, you can't have an energy discussion today without talking about renewable energy, in particular wind and solar. Almost every state, almost every country in the world, it is part of the public policy, it's part of the national discussion. And the good news, uh, renewable energy happens to be a major percentage of new energy additions on the grid. Not traditional, new additions, they are a significant percentage. But overall, they remain a very small percentage of the total energy mix today. And so, 
I think it's uh, obvious and, and we know that energy storage can be a major enabler for more renewables on the grid. Another driver and another mega trend for driving energy storage moving forward is the problem statement we defined at the previous slide, which is from an infrastructure perspective. The electric supply system is expensive, it's underutilized, and energy storage is the perfect solution to help bring that utilization up and at the same time lower the cost of electricity delivery. And that's um, well modeled, there are enough of the economics out there. Energy storage happens to be, I mean, for example, battery storage happens to be kind of expensive historically, but I'll, I'll show you in a slide or two. The good news is that the prices have come down and continue to come down at a steep curve that, uh, frankly, we are very excited about what energy storage is going to do on the grid. Another area that um, is very interesting is electric vehicles. So we said renewables are enabling energy storage. Talk about the infrastructure, the design of it, the underutilization is driving energy storage. But electric vehicles, when people talk about electric vehicles, many think at the first order approximation that, okay, electric vehicles have batteries inside. So they are an energy storage media that will be connected to the grid. And that is true, that is true, but if you look at the method and the process through which an electric vehicle is connected to the grid, you'll start noticing few things. One, batteries in general are a net load at the end of the year. They're not a net generation asset, they're net load. So there's increased consumption so the electrification of the transportation infrastructure will bring net load to the grid. <clears throat> and frankly, some people argue, well, you know, that generation is going to come from coal or come from fossil fuels. But the fact is, a large percentage will be coming from renewables. So it's a good thing that we have internal combustion engines getting replaced by electric vehicles. And then at the grid level, we can produce those electrons, those kilowatt hours or megawatt hours through clean sources. So it's a good solution. We should all encourage the adoption of electric vehicles. But when we look at some of the, uh, call them startup transients associated with the deployment of electric vehicles, you run into a few things. And I, I, I do want to talk about them because they, there is a, uh, a nexus between electric vehicles and grid storage outside of the electric vehicles themselves. You hear today about fast charges for electric vehicles, meaning it's, it's the ability to charge your car in 30 minutes or something like that, rather than trickle charge over many, many hours at home or at your worker place or you know, kind of plug in into an outlet. So there's level one, there's level two, and as you go up in these levels, the power delivery goes up. <clears throat> but then we have what's called DC chargers, fast DC chargers. These are higher level of voltage, a higher level of power delivery, and that's a burst of energy in a way that charges the battery. And so what is the issue with, the, with that? The issue with that is that if you want to charge your battery, your EV, quickly in 30 minutes or 45 minutes, you might not have the power capacity at that location on the grid. So a home, for example, definitely does not have the connectivity to the grid to deliver a fast charger power, which tends to be you know, over 100 kilowatt. It could be 200, it could be 300, depending on what level and what type of uh, battery you're charging. Uh, so that power is not available at a residential level. So if you were to go home and you want to charge 30 minutes and get on the road again, cannot do that. Um, so that typically is found more at commercial and industrial locations. But then there is, so, so one, even at an industrial or commercial location, they might not have 
the infrastructure for providing fast charger power. They might have power that's just enough for, let's say, at this building. It was designed for classrooms, for uh, monitors, air conditioning, whatever the load is. But whenever it was built, I don't think the electrical engineers then thought about a group of fast chargers to be connected to this infrastructure. So there's a high chance that the infrastructure is not there today. You might go buy a car tomorrow, and you know it's going to take more than longer than tomorrow to bring a fast charger infrastructure to that location. So hold on to the thought that fast charger infrastructure is not readily available. The second issue you run into when you have fast charging infrastructure is that by the, the definition it's a fast charger. So you have a burst of energy in 30 minutes or so. And that energy, when you look at commercial and industrial tariffs, electricity tariffs, at the residential level, you pretty much pay, there's a delivery charge that's kind of fixed. Doesn't matter what your load profile looks like. And you are paying for the <coughs> kilowatt hours you're consuming. How many kilowatt hours for the month, you pay for that. Commercial and industrial loads have a different tariff. And there is a component in that tariff called the demand charge. So if there are two neighbors, commercial neighbors, consume the same amount of electrons, same amount of kilowatt hours at the end of the month, but one consume that in a steady fashion over 30 days, and another one consume the same but in a 30 minute fast charge, just one, once a month, one 30 minute fast charge the bill between the two would be significantly different. And it could be, I, you know, depending on the tariff, could be multiple tens differential between the two. And the reason is, if that power got consumed in a, in a burst, that means the wires have to be larger. That means the grid has to have enough energy on standby. So the utilities designed a tariff that monitors your consumption every 15 minutes and they take the peak in a month for that 15 minute peak and becomes a multiplier added to your bill as a demand charge addition. So the peaky behavior of the load can disrupt, significantly disrupt the, the bill, the financial consumption. And so people might do the math, oh, if I have an electric vehicle, it's a uh, hundred kilowatt hours and I will charge it at 10 cents, that's a $10 charge. That is not the case the demand charge could be tens of dollars more for, for that behavior. So, so I just mentioned one is the lack of infrastructure, the second is the demand charge, and that is where energy storage external to the vehicle can come to the rescue. Meaning, if you have an energy storage, it's a battery in a way, at that location, it can trickle charge over 24 hours and be the local buffer to quickly discharge and charge the vehicle that gets to be mobile and move on. And this way, you have translated that pulse into a flatter load, so you avoid the demand charge, and at the same time, you enabled a fast charge without necessarily having an upgraded infrastructure in terms of transmission or distribution. You know, we're talking about distribution in, in this case. So, so how, this is how you see electric vehicles. The infrastructure for electric vehicles is actually an enabler and a mega trend that's opening the doors for more storage on the grid. I, I'm not going to go through every single component, but frankly, there's over 20 applications of energy storage on the grid. And so we, we might think, okay, I'm just going to charge from the sun or the wind, and then discharge it on the grid. But the, the grid is so complex, and the mar what we call the market products on the grid are also complex, and uh, there are economics associated with who you are, when you're consuming, <coughs> how you're consuming it, what is your role as a participant on the grid. And we, we see that if you are in an off-grid, you're not connected to a larger grid, uh, application energy storage helps charge the power or energy from renewables and discharge it at the right time. 
if you are what we call an ISO, an RTO, this is an independent system operator, uh, this is kind of like a wholesale market for suppliers and, and, and load-serving entities who buy and sell energy as a, as a commodity. There are a bunch of applications there as well in, in the wholesale market. You can buy high or buy, sorry, buy low, sell high. You can arbitrage just like in the stock market. There are what we call ancillary services. There's a group of ancillary services. There's spin reserve, non-spin reserve. There's black start. There's a bunch of those uh, revenue streams open on the wholesale side. Utilities are the wire companies that bring the electrons to your location. And those tend to be a monopoly because I can tomorrow change in the U.S. my energy supplier, where I buy my electrons from. Most markets allow you to choose your electron supplier. But you cannot wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I want another utility to run a wire to my, to my home or my office. That is engaged with public land. That is a monopoly, and thus there, is, there are commissioners who oversee that monopoly, and it's a, it's a highly regulated space. But in there, there are also a bunch of applications associated with energy storage. And some of them are what we call uh, transmission or distribution deferral applications, uh, congestion management, and so on. And then there's another group who are the consumers behind the meter. We call behind the meter applications. So we in this building are behind the meter application with the lights or, or the monitor. We're not a delivery company. We're not a generator. We are a consumer behind the meter. And we mentioned earlier the demand charge. So managing the demand charge is one of the applications for energy storage. And so collectively, there's actually over 20 of use cases for energy storage on the grid. There's a lot of information on this slide, uh, but suffice to say that the energy storage market is growing and growing significantly. And, and frankly, um, almost every, every quarter or so that the forward look and outlook of energy storage is reviewed by the analysts, it's going up. And the, this is an early market for energy storage, kind of similar to how solar was 10 to 15 years ago. So there are a lot of policies driving the market in addition to market economics that are driving energy storage. And you can see that in 2018, from about 400 megawatts of annual deployment of energy storage, that by 2023, almost four gigawatts of energy storage. That's a significant uptick in adoption. You can ask now. I mean, the professor, up to you. Um, yeah. So you're, you're saying that there's a demand charge, but it, it seems that, but like, I mean, that kind of falls in line with, with I don't know, I, I mean, I, I suppose it's a monopoly. I don't know if it's just GE, because it's, you know, you have to have the, um, you have to have the contract from the government. Um, but back to my point, you know, that demand charge, um, I mean, can't they technically price discriminate? Is that is that is, is the demand charge a price, is, is like a form of price discrimination? It, the demand charge is a price signal to the market to keep your consumption as flat as possible, mm -hmm. to simplify the complexity of supply, because if we uh, kind of at the residential level, it's kind of all you can eat electrons at a flat price whether you consume it at 6 p.m. or 6 a.m. Now, some states are changing that with time of use pricing, with smart meters, but the me most meters at home, they run at the same speed all day long, meaning per, per kilowatt hour, and you go up and down. The utility doesn't know when you consume that. So they're putting a ceiling. So for residential today, it's a kind of a tariff based on kilowatt hours, commercial and industrial. Yeah. The consumption is monitored every 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and spikes in load are priced higher. And again, to motivate behavior to remain yeah. flat. So, 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 yeah, so really decrease, decrease the amount. Decrease of, spikes uh, in the, yeah. Yeah, 
kind of traffic, you know. Um, at the same time, I'm also wondering, though, um, is there is there antitrust law um, <coughs> that is, is that does that serve as an antitrust law kind of thing? I don't think so. No, no, I mean, it, it's truly based on the techno-economics of the system. It's almost like discouraging people to drive into New York City between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. So you can have an increased tariff or toll just to ease the traffic because traffic causes pollution, causes delay for people. So it, it's a price signal to you, say, please, can you consume in the middle of the night? rather than at 6 p.m. when most residential load, people go home, turn on the oven, turn on the lights. So we happen to have an evening load in this area because we're not an industrial. Ah, so yeah. keep demand even. Keep demand even, yeah. exactly. Okay? So, so what you can see from here, um, from this data, that energy storage is actually growing, and growing nicely. So if, if anyone is thinking about a career, Someone is thinking about an area that uh, the market is taking off. Energy storage is that one. And this is a slide that shows the dollars. So there, even though there's a, an ASP, an average selling price reduction per megawatt and megawatt hour, pretty much it's still a growing market. And it's becoming a multi-billion dollar market in the United States. And this is what I, what I referred to earlier uh, that research shows that what we are, the experience curve for energy storage is following something similar to what we saw with solar energy about 10 or 15 years ago. Solar energy, I mean, I remember when I got in the solar industry, the cost per watt installed was, you know, 6 to $10 of the cost of, of uh, solar, depending on the location and, and the size. And today, it is not uncommon to see projects that are getting built in many places in the world at a cost of less than a dollar per watt. That's a significant reduction, and the efficiency is better, the reliability is better, the design is easier, and so you, you know, these are all multipliers to the performance of the system. We're seeing something similar with energy storage, so that's very encouraging, which means when when we price systems, when we look at forward-looking performance, you can price forward-looking curves into a project. And projects tend to take time, whether it's few months or few years to, to deploy. You can take advantage of the reduction in price going forward. Isn't it like solar cell, for example, is made of parts of one that but lithium ion batteries are made of lithium and cobalt, which are not really common. And I guess the elemental price is going up, although the pack price is going down because of the processing optimization. So do you expect that trend will continue? That's a good question. Um, so when you look at the cost of batteries, the biggest component, if you look at a Pareto analysis of the cost contributors in a battery, it tends to be the metal in the battery. So cobalt, you mentioned with, with lithium, you know, with NCM lithium ion batteries, uh, with lead acid, you know, it's the lead. It's actually lithium ion, it's not the lithium that is the biggest cost component. And in lithium, in some, some cathodes are using titanium, so it's a titanium could be anywhere between 20 to 40% of the cost of the cell. Uh, so your answer is yes. The, we're talking about system cost. And so in the system, you have the cell, obviously you have the anode, the cathode, electrolytes, you have the cell, you have the module, you have the rack, you have the BMS, you have the energy management system, you have the PCS, which is a power conditioning system, you have the EPC, engineering, procurement, construction, you have financing, which means if this is a bankable I know some people here have a finance background. If this is a bankable system, that means the risk is less. That means the cost of financing is less, which means the cost per le the levelized cost is less. So it is an aggregation, even though some of the elements might be going up. And, and frankly, um, 
we see some disruptive uh, applications that might further reduce the cost. There's a, a lot of, there's billions of dollars of R&D going into batteries today. A lot of smart people working on solving the problem. And, and so we do see in the next five to 10 years continued reduction across the board. Okay. This is uh, a slide published uh, by the Rocky Mountain Institute and, and funded by the state of New York. And here you, what you see is a regrouping of the energy storage solutions on the grid, again by the ISO or the utilities or behind the meter. And one of the takeaways of this slide, regardless of the exact dollar amount on the x-axis on the top, you see the relative services. So even though we might say, okay, I'm gonna arbitrage by low, sell high, there is a cost for, let's say, batteries for a full cycle. You charge the battery and discharge it. Batteries, their life is not really measured by shelf life. It's measured by how many times you charge it and discharge it. That wears the batteries out, so this, the number of cycles. It could be a few hundred, it could be a few thousand. So that's how we measure them. And then there's a round trip efficiency loss. Obviously, you lose something along the way. And so some applications, and let's say we're talking about the same depth of discharge, some will support thousands, like lithium ion will have thousands of cycles, lead acid typically hundreds. And again, there's variations to the technology in between. And when you look at the various applications, you'll see the relative value. So in the wholesale market, there's something called frequency regulation. That happened to be an attractive market in the PGM area where we are. But then with oversubscription, prices went down. If you look at distribution and transmission deferral with the utilities, meaning use batteries downstream at a congested area until you get a chance to upgrade the grid, because remember that overload happens for a few weeks out of the year. You can use a battery, wait a few years until you get a chance to build the transmission or distribution system. Behind the meter, we talked about demand charge. And one of the takeaways is that most of these economic applications are limited in their outlook. The battery could be a 15 to 20 year asset, but the market application might be for a year or two. So deferral, you need it until you defer, you know, like the system for two to three years. The frequency reg wholesale market is merchant, could be up, could be down. No one is guaranteeing you revenue for 20 years. So you have 10 to 20 year energy storage systems where the revenue might be short lived. And that's frankly um, what led uh, to the thinking, for example, of mobile energy storage. So this way the system can be deployed where it's needed in the summer at a summer peaking site. And then in the winter, you can move it to attend to a winter challenge. Spring, you might have another solar site with a lot of back feed issues. You bring it to a, so, uh, a spring location. And now the same chemistry or the same asset can go to three or four location per year, three months at a time instead of having four different systems. So the utilization is, is much better. Now, the nice thing about energy storage is we have a positive feedback mechanism here. As energy storage gets to be cheaper, it opens the door for more renewables. The more renewables are on the grid, the more energy storage we need. So that's a positive feedback cycle and a nexus between energy storage and other kind of complements on the, on the grid. And that's a positive thing. And so energy storage, too much of it actually is a good thing because it unlocks so many of the other sources. Now to bring, to bring the story about energy storage locally and, and kind of around who we are, um, first of all, we uh, being in, in the met, New York metropolitan area, uh, we happen to be in a region and part of the Northeast here and, and other places in, in the US and elsewhere that we see a strong commitment for energy storage. Uh, strong co commitment in terms of policies, strong commitment in terms of financing, uh, 
and whether it's utilities, whether it's uh, uh, policy makers, or, you know, legislator, there's a commitment for energy storage. Uh, for example, in uh, New Jersey, we have a target, a published target uh, by the Murphy administration for 600 megawatts of energy storage by 2021. And in New York, we see 1,500 megawatts by 2025. And in both states, New Jersey and New York, we have a 2030 target of 2,000 megawatts in New Jersey and 3,000 megawatts in New York. If you were to use some of the earlier numbers between megawatts and dollars, that, those two alone represent over a $5 billion market just in New Jersey and New York for energy storage between today and 2030. Yes. Um, you know, I went to school, uh, and I, I've seen Binghamton, I've seen Utica, I've seen Elmira. Um, and my second question follows, um, are there opportunities for employment based on um, if, if, if there were more equal distribution for, um, for that, that megawatt you're talking about? That's a good question, Alex. So where do you site energy storage? And, and is it, what are the design parameters? What are the techno-economic factors associated with the placement and siting of energy storage? So there are kind of two components. And let's address the traditional system. Traditional system are these you know, fossil-based or nuclear-based generating, you know, centralized generating sites connected to distribution, uh, transmission, then to distribution, then to loads that are distributed. And the, we are in a, what we call a load following design. I, I go home, I turn on the light, I expect the electrons to show up. It's a, it's a kind of just in time you know, system. And so storage is most impactful right next to me as a load because then that load needs to be managed and needs to be buffered and needs to behave properly so that it can be serviced. So, so that's the traditional system. And for example, in New York, upstate New York has an abundance of hydropower, wind power, different forms of energy generation, but most of the load is in zone J in New York, where New York City is. And so that con there's a congestion. There, there, it's not easy to bring transmission from upstate New York into New York City. And that congestion causes congestion pricing, causes a drop of energy prices in upstate New York, and a rise of energy prices, just any supply demand of a commodity and, and a, the channel. So, so you could expect that the initial set of deployments in New York to be Focus. As a matter of fact, we talk about $350 million of incentives made available by the Department of Public Service in New York. 250 of that initially are going to be uh, associated with Con Edison service area. So right there you can see the ratio to deploy energy storage uh, within the service area by 2022. And that's logical from an engineering design perspective and the techno-economic analyses. The other area that can attract energy storage is being right next to intermittent sources. So if you have wind or solar, but doesn't necessarily have to be next to the load, wherever that intermittent source is, coupling that with storage, we call it firms that supply and makes it dispatchable, okay? So in this case, it could be a wind farm in upstate New York, and you need storage right next to the wind farm. It could be a solar farm somewhere in South Jersey. You need storage right next to it. So in terms of uh, the, to make it equitable and to create jobs across the grid, 
frankly, energy storage does that because wherever the load is concentrated, you need storage, and wherever you have these large intermittent generation systems, you also need storage. Do you think that the fact that um, do, do you think that the pricing <coughs> is equitable though? That um, that the demand the demand um, pricing that, that you refer to um, is equitable that because there are more people that's congested here than there are in other places there. The um, they're they're getting the jobs, yeah. but they're paying they're not paying as much for their for their energy. Um, and down here we're paying more because we're getting, we're getting more of, of the energy being that, that is the, we're, definitely, we're definitely paying more in urban centers. Right. And it's, again, driven by the fact, I mean, there, it, there was a project that Con Edison looked at in the Brooklyn, Queens area. This is public information where they needed to upgrade the system by an added capacity of 68 megawatts. Uh, 68 megawatts, if you are in Pennsylvania, if you're in Virginia, if you're in upstate New York, it might be, let's say, $10 million, $20 million, just as an example of, of added cost associated with 68 megawatts. In New York City, according to Con Edison's estimates, the cost to, for, the, for that upgrade was over a billion dollars. Now, why is that? Well, I mean, if you go to New York City and you need land, there's no land. If you need to dig up the streets and make sure you manage traffic, and now when you dig up the streets, you have all kinds of conduits and wires, and good luck, you know, or you need to put up a substation. Or, so it, it is expected. And as a matter of fact, what we see is moving forward, the cost of delivery, we expect that to continue to go up. Because, for example, in New Jersey, we have, you know, development in the suburbs and so on, which means if you had a chance before to build transmission lines, 50 years ago, you've had many choices. Today, to bring transmission line coming to Hoboken, that's going to be a tough challenge. So, so with that, that's, if you remember, we talked about the most expensive machine, the grid, that's only 41% utilized. In a way, you can say, well, we're lucky it's only 41% utilized because energy storage deployed in a distributed fashion where the load is can possibly double the average delivery from 41% to 80-some percent for the same T&D infrastructure by placing the right energy storage in the right locations. Okay. Other questions? So this is my, my, please. I'm sorry, just a quick one. What type of scale do you expect with the energy storage? Are you thinking like every household has their own energy storage system? You can vary by town? That, that's a good question. So when we look at energy storage today, we see batteries uh, on the grid from about one or two kilowatt hours of energy storage, because energy is measured by kilowatt hours or megawatt hours. Power is measured by kilowatt or megawatt, which is one is the rate of delivery, one is the total kind of number of charges delivered, electrons and so on. Um, so at the residential level, and it, it is not a big uh, market today, the small residential systems, and again, because of the tariff, because of the connectivity, I'm talking about the United States. Australia is different, for example. Australia, you see an uptick in residential storage because their grid prices are expensive, solar is cheap, and residential storage allows them to self-consume excess solar energy. Instead of putting it back on the grid in the form of net metering or losing it, now it's, it's called self-consumption. California has a program called SGIP, which stands for uh, self uh, generation incentive program, I believe the, the acronym is. Um, Hawaii as well, uh, they're residential systems. But then we see, there was a slide early. What, what you see here, you see the legend at the bottom? 
between residential, non-residential, and front of the meter. Front of the meter tends to be large utility scale. And then non-residential and residential is kind of between commercial, industrial, and residential. So pretty much all segments are taken off, but we expect the early phase is to be more of the front of the meter utility scale, large megawatts and megawatt hours. Who owns the different components of the grid? That's, uh, so the grid that's coming to your home is owned by the distribution utilities, which are the monopolies. So, um, and that, because they are a monopoly, they tend to be heavily regulated by commissioners. So in New York City, Con Edison, where we are here today, PSENG. And so those, they, they kind of own the wires. Now, some people say, well, technically, they don't own the wires because we, the rate payers, people who pay electricity uh, bill at the end of the month, the rate payers gave the money to the regulated utilities to procure the wires and the poles and the transformers. So you can argue that the rate payers on the system that is entrusted to the regulated utilities. And the regulated utilities fall in three categories. There are what we call IOUs, investor-owned utilities. So PSENG and Con Edison are investor-owned utilities. Some of them can be publicly traded on the market, but it's investors who own that business and can be sold and bought between different investors. Another group of utilities are called municipal utilities. They tend to be more of the uh, kind of suburban and, and rural smaller towns that they own their own utility. Uh, but some of them, you know, the, then they are public. Public not in the sense they're publicly listed, but they're public. But there is a very large public utility called LADWP, the Los Angeles uh, Department of Water and Power. It's one of the largest in the country and it's public. And then you have what's called the rural cooperatives. These tend to be uh, member-owned utilities in rural and agricultural uh, sectors. And, and those are kind of, they are in, you know, outside of these towns and outside of the large urban centers where the IUs tend to be. So the three sectors, and there's, in, in total, I think there's about 300 IUs, about 2,000 municipal uh, electric utilities, and about 900 cooperatives. So it's over 3,000. It's a, an interesting question. Many countries around the world, uh, we, we went through a, a deregulation in the late 90s, and many countries around the world are following what we have done here in deregulating the electricity sector between the GENCOs, the TRANSCOs, and the DISCOs, and then creating what we call the ISOs, the independent system operator, to be a nonprofit organization in between for balancing payments and bids and supply. So it is, our system is very complex and sophisticated and actually cost efficient to a large degree. And many countries in the world have a different variation of deregulation. Sometimes they keep transmission and generation in the hands of the government and they sell distribution to local companies. Sometimes they privatize the transmission. So transmission in the US is mostly private. Private companies can own it, yeah. Other questions? So we are coming to an end of, of my talk, and, and I meant to um, really open it here to see, you know, before the talk, I asked many of you about your background, what you're studying, what your interest is. And as you can see, energy storage is taking off. There are mega trends enabling energy storage. And in my personal experience, I have seen people from different walks of life, different academic background, are strong participants, even leaders, of the energy storage revolution. Because we are literally experiencing a game changing uh, dynamics and economics associated with energy storage. It is a worthy cause because solving the energy storage problem and cost and, and deployment methods can give us a real shot at attending to climate change. 
Otherwise, you know, solar and wind can only get to a certain point and can only be firmed up by fossil, which is really not the solution. We don't have enough hydropower, and hydropower is geographically dependent. You can't have hydropower in the desert or, you know, in a town. So energy storage can come to the rescue. And some of the areas uh, that you, if you are focusing on sustainability, some of the areas, for example, that you can make a huge impact is starting with uh, on the policy side in, in terms of whether, you know, like Alex, from an economics perspective, uh, whether from an electrical engineering, whether from... So today, for example, the state of New Jersey set out goals for energy storage in the state of New Jersey. As we speak, uh, there is a request from the Board of Public Utilities asking for comments from the public to how should we and what method and what size and when and who and so on, how do we meet the targets that are set out in, in policy and in laws. Any, any one of you can participate. There are public hearings. There, uh, you know, so take your local expertise, take your area of interest, participate there. The more you understand it, the more you participate, the more you engage and impact, then from a career perspective, the more you are you know, more desirable by people who are in the private sector. I know uh, a lot of people are hiring across the board for energy storage. I know public institutions. I know there's a need for consultants, need for engineers. Uh, definitely, if you're technical and if you're a, a chemist, a chemical engineer, a uh, mechanical engineer, there's uh, challenges on the supply side, the design. If you're in, in the environmental space, how do we source the elements in a sustainable fashion? Uh, across the full supply chain, please. Who do you envision as going to be the owners of these storage? Is it independent businesses? Is it the utility company? Is it the energy? Yes. Uh, we, we, looked at, we looked earlier at the three sectors. And so in the merchant, the wholesale side, we call those independent power producers. These are the people who would own a power plant. So they can own energy storage. So that's a sector. On the distribution side, the utilities, the Con Edison's, the PSENG's, should own energy storage because it's part of the tool kit and set that they have. But also residential, can own energy storage for self-consumption. Commercial and industrial can own energy storage for demand charge reduction. So you could see many end sector owners existed, and they do. I mean, today they are buying, they are leasing, and there are new business models that have not been introduced in the market yet. Mm -hmm. So there's opportunities for entrepreneurs to be able to establish a business. Absolutely. Yeah. There are I mean, we are aware of many unmet needs in the market today. And literally, there's a shortage of people with the right expertise to participate. As we speak, there's an energy storage conference in Albany, New York, where the energy storage industry, um, I, I personally was going to be there, but I wanted to be with you today, uh, the, there, where the energy storage uh, ecosystem are meeting with uh, policymakers and so on. As I said, New Jersey is looking for input on how to get energy storage in the system and what method. There's a need everywhere. Is the engineering at, at right now with these systems, is it, where the, is, is it really defined now or is it still changing as far as the quality of the storage? Is that something that still has to develop? I would say today over 95% of, for example, the energy storage additions on the grid, for example, in the U.S. are lithium ion batteries. And so they are bankable. Uh, they are well understood. But the good news, uh, they are also leveraging the EV market that's consuming lithium ion in large quantities and helping reduce the cost. So y the answer is yes, uh, but there are also disruptive solutions that are in early stages, different level in early stages that we believe the future is going to be very bright. It's going to continue to go down. It's not a question, like more of a comment. Like I think, um, you know, like the, this energy storage is the holy grail of green energy. You know, like we, we are really like again thinking of uh, the projections that uh, you 
put out there, you know, by 20, 20, 30, I guess, the kind of megawatt hours we're going to generate and use. And like, again, this, this needs to pick up because I remember like uh, when Sandy happened and, uh, you know, electricity went down, so we had to go to a hotel and after the fourth day, my wife started shouting at me that, this is the reason I asked you to go for solar here. <laughs> I, I couldn't, like again, she has a PhD in public administration. Yeah. She's not from a science background, and she was obviously very irritated at that. The sun is out, but we yes. have no power. Exactly. <laughs> so I told her that again, it has got nothing to do with like when electricity outages happen. Yes. Because we do not store that energy. Exactly. You know, I think that down the road, you know, once we have the capacity to store what we are getting from our rooftop. Yes. This is going to be much more user friendly because now like I can I cannot afford a power bill from Tesla. It's so expensive. So if it becomes like a common man's yes. thing, you know, like then only we yes. can basically afford to do that. It's basically a demand and supply kind of a Exactly. Thing. And I, I th when you do the analyses and we have done many around the country, energy storage is in the money today. Part of the challenge is actually the good system that we have, the highly deregulated system with the different participants. But at the end of the day, the ratepayers pay the bill in aggregate. And so if the ratepayers owned energy storage, it is in the money in many places. I, I saw a number, I think downstate New York pays over a billion dollars a year for uh, congestion. As a matter of fact, in the very first slide, I mentioned that the top 1% is responsible for the 10% of the total cost of energy. So by deploying energy storage to shave the peak by 1%, you have an annual budget of 10% of the electricity spent. It is so much in the money to take the top even 10%. We did the macroeconomic numbers in New, Jer in New Jersey, and if you took 40% of the energy cost on an annual basis, just to, to shave the 10% of the peak, you can easily do it with energy storage today, and you have so much more money that's left as a saving for the ratepayers. So it, we need innovation also in the business models beyond the, because energy storage acts as a load and as a generator at the same time. And, and that's unique. No one can envision that in the design of the system. All right, well, it's thanks, Shihab. Thank you.